the presentation by the two authors of, of, of the papers, uh, Johannes uh, Bauer and uh, Thiago Prado. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I wanted to just take a couple of minutes because it gives me an opportunity to congratulate Tiago, who just defended his dissertation last week. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Successfully, I should say, and it's the, one of the first cases that I remember where there were no corrections are demanded from the committee. So, so he is, for all practical pur purposes, now Dr. Tiago Prado. And, uh, and this work is actually also part of his dissertation. It's, it's, a, it's part of a broader research agenda that we have at, the, at Michigan State University on um, digital innovation, uh, digital platform governance, um, and, and governance in the digital economy in general. Now, if we had had this conference five or 10 years ago, we would have all praised digital platforms as, as paragons of innovation. To me, I've, I've been around for long enough to, to notice how how much of a change this is, right? I mean, that within less than a decade, our perspective has completely flipped. Uh, and if you look, or at least in, in many, many instances, right, and for good reasons and for bad reasons, uh, if you look, for example, at the, at the multiple reports in the UK, they name 80 harms that are associated with the activities of digital platforms. That's, that's a number of, of harms, right? And, and as you can imagine, if you're in policy, it's probably difficult to fix all 80 at once. And, um, but it's an important discussion. I think to some degree what we see is that platforms have not measured up to some of their responsibilities, given how important they are. And our paper wants to focus on one harm in the context. And the concerns that we have is that sometimes fears and imagination takes uh, the better part of us. And so we wanted to really look at the empirical evidence and, and assess carefully in a larger data set than others have done whether there is indeed uh, uh, harms associated with digital platform uh, acquisitions of startup startups. We'll walk you through this in six brief steps. I'll talk about number one and then uh, Tiago will take over. And so like in many other dynamic systems, what we see that, uh, that when it comes to the question of how do digital platform acquisitions relate to innovation or resources for innovation, really we have to take into account that there's positive and negative feedbacks you don't see the positive ones, they're on the right side behind the EUI kind of a little slide here. So for example, uh, big tech startups might stifle entrepreneurship and the, the discussion on killer acquisition has focused on this, this point. But on the other hand, uh, they could sort of uh, be seen as, as, uh, as signaling devices, right, for others to identify promising ways to go forward and attract innovation. They're also an important exit strategy for many venture capitalists. And so the existing studies, uh, at least at the time when we wrote this paper, were typically focusing on small numbers of acquisitions. And what we try to do here is look at the broader record by looking at a much larger uh, number of, of, of acquisitions and see what the net effect of those two potential effects are. Now the background behind this and other projects that we're doing is, is a very, very specific view of innovation. Uh, and we go beyond the very trite uh, typical look at innovation as new processes, new services, new products, and so forth. But we use a combinatorial view of innovation, more or less like probably Brian Arthur is the one who has prom uh, promoted this for a long time now. Uh, innovation is a combinatorial search process of an exploration of an adjacent possibility uh, that we that 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 uh, entrepreneurs uh, explore, and there are several factors that influence the rate of direction and direction of innovation innovation opportunities, contestability uh, of the activities, the appropriability of future innovation rents, strategic capabilities, and then also the resources for innovation. Now, many of those factors actually have both positive and negative effects on innovation. So the outcome is, needs to be very, very carefully modeled. But we conjecture actually for this purpose of this paper that, that resources is one of the factors that is typically positively associated with innovation activities. So by looking at resources for innovation, but we can also at least shine a light on, on innovation activities indirectly. And so I turn it over to you, Tiago. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Barrow, for the introduction and, and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, where's the pointer? Here. I'll just now introduce a little bit about the, the data set and the, and, the, and the empirical model that I, I used and then, and, and then the, like some, some results. I don't want to bother too much you with equations and uh, uh, formulas, especially before lunch. So 
<laughs> but I will, I will just, in a nutshell, try to, to summarize what I had in terms of data. Basically, I used a time frame, uh, like actually venture capital activity uh, happened from to, like 2010 to 2020. Uh, uh, and when I, I, I say venture capital activity, I mean like deals, each deal that happened worldwide was tracked by one, like one startup called CB Insights, which called like tracked uh, not just venture capital activity, but also M&As and IPOs in different industries, in different sectors and subsectors of, of, of like uh, of each industry. So it's a quite uh, a detailed data set that I, I, I that we had chance to to work on that we grouped in 44 quarters from 2010 to 2020. And uh, just to I'm not sure if it's, it's possible to read, but it, just to give a sense on, on the industries, uh, I had 173 industry segments just in the tech industry, overarching tech industry, uh, not just in the US, but in Europe as well. So I had actually three, I worked with three panels, one panel with venture capital activity, M&As happening worldwide, another one just focused on the US, and the third one just focused on Europe. Um, and I could do these for other, other, other uh, regions as well. And I had like number of venture capital deals, uh, funding per industry segment, also average venture capital funding uh, uh, per deal, per industry segment, per quarter, number of platform acquisitions of startups. So I've, I've dealt with uh, almost 400 uh, acquisitions made by the big tax. And when I meant like the big tax are the five ones, like the five US ones, uh, maybe an expansion to these would be working on the on the big tax in China as well, uh, which is a different ecosystem there. But uh, for this work, we we focused on the on the western side of the globe, let's say. So also IPOs and mergers and acquisitions. These are like more than thirty thousand uh, uh, venture capital deals, uh, IPOs and M and As, other than the platform acquisitions uh, of, of startups, are about six thousand, almost six point five thousand acquisitions and M&As during this time frame. And so from this data set, and it, just before the, the, the equations, I will show a little bit, like this slide gives a little bit of sense on how the, uh, how the variables uh, behave throughout the years. So you see a clear time trend on the, on the right side, on the, on the two uh, figures in the, in the right side of your panel. Um, but I would like to focus on this big one in the left side where you have, for example, the 173 industry segments in a column and uh, in the in the Y axis and the 44 quarters in the in the X axis. And then each black rectangle there is is an industry segment and quarter where an acquisition happened when a, one of the big five uh, digital platforms acquired a startup in an industry segment. And you see that this happens many times throughout the one st specific industry segment or one specific quarter in different industry segments, which uh, include a lot of uh, challenges for identifying effects. Afterwards, I will, I will talk a little bit more about this. So I use two approaches to try to identify the, the, the effects of the platform acquisitions on the venture capital activity. The first one is, is uh, trying to understand the responses uh, to this uh, like acquisition. So what I, 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 I try to portray, I don't want to go in too much detail. We could go afterwards in the, in the questions, but it's basically an exponential model that uh, control, it's a fixed effects, like two-way fixed effects model that controls uh, uh, for for uh, the idiosyncratic uh, characteristics of the industries and also uh, time um, wise. So what I have here is actually the the y in the in the left of the equal uh, sign is basically like the level of venture capital activity per industry segment per quarter. And I I use three main variables to to represent this. First, the number of venture capital deals that happened in that industry segment in that quarter. Another one is the like amount of funding per industry segment per quarter. And the third one is the average funding per, cap per, per deal per industry segment and quarter. And I regress this against the 
like number of platform acquisitions in that industry segment, not just in the same timing, but also three quarters before, because maybe an acquisition that happened this quarter would uh, affect venture capital activity in the future, maybe in, in, in the next quarter or in the, in the, in the, in, in the maybe in one year. So this is this is uh, how I I, I I modeled the the data like the like the problem that we have and I controlled for some variables like that could also attract venture capital uh, funding for example the the number of IPOs and the number of other M&As that happened in the same industry segments in the same quarters and uh, but there are other other uh, variables that could be like unobservables that are controlled by the idiosyncratic term CI at the beginning of my of my specification. So f briefly results of, of, of this of this strategy I found um, like somehow positive like short term positive results uh, on venture capital activity after the acquisitions. So for example this uh, this in the left side of your, like this, this panel in the left side of the screen is the United States analysis and, and, the, and the right side is Europe. You will see that uh, in average, in the, in the whole year, uh, you'll see uh, venture capital deals increasing in 21% after, uh, in an industry segment. Uh, this is a combined effect after, after one acquisition in an industry segment, while in, in Europe, this is much higher in terms of effect. Um, it goes to like 130% increasing funding. And I have different specifications of, of, of this problem with different uh, estimation methods. The, the columns one, uh, like column one of, of both graphs just uh, focus on like the regression of the venture capital activity against the platform acquisitions without control variables. The two, like the second column, uh, includes the, the, the control variables. And the third one, which is actually the third and the sixth one, which are the most, most uh, robust in terms, like empirically robust, they also include uh, like the dependent variables as regressors to, to control for serial correlation. So basically here we found that results like effects on especially on venture capital uh, uh, deals number of venture capital deals of venture capital funding uh, are positive after the acquisitions not negative of, as as uh, as we have seen in other in other analysis um, and not just with this we try to use another approach to try to identify causality between them so there I had associations. And now trying to, like, to identify causality, what I did was uh, using a, a difference in difference uh, setup, but with a little bit uh, differences because of our data set. If you remember, our, our data set had a lot of uh, treatments in the same uh, um, industries uh, throughout the time. So this creates a lot of hard, like, difficulties to identify uh, um, causality using using the traditional difference in different setup. So we used a setup that was proposed by Imai Kim and Wang very recently uh, in 2021 that use actually do three steps. They try to identify among those industry segments which are the ones who have uh, same uh, treatment history in a window, let's say in, in three quarters before the treatment and so on and so forth. So they pack them in control sets and then they call, like they use a prop, uh, they use in the step to a propensity score weighting procedure to create counterfactuals and then uh, do the difference in difference uh, normal setup. So it's just two steps added before the normal difference in difference setup to try to ident like to uh, to control and to identify uh, causal effects. Here are some, some of the results that we found in the, in the, these are for, in the right, actually in the left side, you have results for like average treatment effects considering all acquisitions. And uh, we saw that results are positive in some cases, for example, for Europe, 
the, the, the number of venture capital deals increase a little bit uh, in the T plus one, which is the first quarter after the acquisition, and then it starts to decrease. In the US, they are pretty, pretty not significant, and worldwide, they start significant, but then they fade away very quickly. In Europe, uh, in Europe is the same, and in this right side, in this graph in the right side, you see the, just the effect of the first acquisition in each industry segment. Because sometimes when we have so many acquisitions happening in, in, in one industry segment, the, the results may confound. Maybe uh, it's, it's, it's hard to identify and then uh, we used, like we did a separate analysis just for what happens after the first acquisition made in each industry segment. And then for this, uh, w we found like results that are higher in magnitude and in, in significance as well. Uh, you have the details here. I don't want, uh, I don't want too much. I don't want to go too much in detail on the on the numbers. But basically, they reinforce what we had on the on the first analysis on having stronger effects in Europe than than in US, but mainly positive effects, uh, especially for the first. Uh, treatment when compared to the average treatment. But interesting thing is that there's a pattern here is that after the, f after the first quarter, maybe uh, second quarter, the effect starts to fade away very quickly. So the, the positive results are not necessarily that significant. In the paper, uh, we also try to understand if there were like cross-regional effects, like let's say, what happens with venture capital activity in Europe in case we had uh, uh, an acquisition of a startup in the same industry segment there in the US? So what would be the, the, the effect here? And, and then we found also uh, interesting like positive results for, for, for EU, for example, um, which are like positive to, to like ev positive effects to to acquisitions made uh, in US, like US acquisition of US-based startups. So you have a lot of uh, uh, details in the, in the paper, uh, just to, to like highlight the main takeaway, which is that we found positive results uh, in, 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 like in average, positive results uh, to venture, like positive results to, to, to big tech startup acquisitions on a very important uh, a resource for innovation, which is venture capital funding. And this, although it's positive, it, it fades away quickly uh, in, in the next three or four quarters. So I, we don't see these, as a, like, these acquisitions as something that really changed dramatically the incentives for, for innovation in the startup ecosystem, especially the venture capital funding for innovation. Uh, hopefully, these these results uh, il like somehow inform the, the the policy discussion, competition policy discussions on what to do with the the intense strategy with acquisitions uh, uh, made by the big tax, the U.S. big tax. If if this would be harmful or not, and how uh, these are results that portray the short term. There are a lot of discussion, and in, in the paper we somehow discuss a little bit. Uh, and in my dissertation, we expand a little bit more on this. Uh, on the sh on the long term effects, but we don't have data to understand the long term effects, so that's why we sh we we keep focus on short term uh, uh, effects that may come from the acquisitions. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. That's excellent <laughs> Pres presentation. And so now for the discussion, we have yeah, come here. Uh, Joe Perkins, who's the senior vice president and head of uh, research at uh, Compass Lexicon. Uh, Thanks very much, Rafi, and, and, and thanks to Tiago and Johannes, because it's a real um, pleasure to read the article and to have the chance to, uh, to give some comments on this. I think as well Tiago also presented it really um, clearly and, and succinctly, so my comments will be, uh, I, I suppose, a, a kind of commentary on some of the issues raised there, but uh, yeah, don't expect me to have profound insights that go beyond, to be honest, what Tiago has already said. I did have a few slides, I should say. I don't know if these are... Um, Aha, okay. Will those just click through? Oh, that's yeah. magic. Okay, fantastic. Um, 
So what's the paper's contribution? Again, of course, Tiago's been through it, but from my perspective, what did I, I take from this as the big messages? Well, first it is the most comprehensive empirical analysis of the impacts of acquisitions of big tech by, by those big tech companies on innovation funding. There's been a very small amount before. I think there's a Kamapali et al. work, for instance, on the kill zone, which people will know, which does this, but it does it with a much smaller data set of, um, of acquisitions. And this is really going into the whole universe of, of VC investment rather than perhaps just into those very big deals, which is what Kamapali et al. Um, are, are concentrating on. And this is clearly an issue that's been much discussed in policy circles. Um, you know, the, the kind of killer acquisition phrase gets bandied about just very regularly indeed, and also in theory work. So Cunning Metal is the killer acquisition paper, but then there's been some very interesting other theory papers, Fumigali, Motta and Tarantino, Motta and Shalegia, and others that, that look at some of these issues, um, but much less empirically so far. So what does it do on the empirical side? I should caveat all this by saying I'm not predominantly an empiricist, but I'll try and give some thoughts on it. There is a, you know, as well as a two-way fixed effects approach, which um, Tiago talked about. There's a, the novel approach to causal attribution based on that, that work by, by M.I. Kim and Wong on those staggered treatment effects. And then as well, it's just a very impressive data set that's been brought together with a, a lot of VC deals, IPOs, and tech acquisitions. So, a really impressive paper, and you know, I, I think that, in a way, is the main takeaway here, but I've got a bit more time to talk, so I'll give a few more thoughts. <laughs> so, what's the setup overall? And, and here, actually, uh, well, from a theory perspective, or a theorist perspective, there's not too much theory going there, so I, I was sort of backing out a few thoughts here. But really, you can think about it as having a bunch of VC investors who are choosing to commit money to projects in different industry segments based on their expectations of the return they'll get. Um, with those sig with a, a range of possible signals of expected returns, but in particular, as studied in the paper, how much merger and IPO activity is there going on? With a sense, perhaps, if there's lots of M&As going on, lots of M&A activity, that means, hey, this is a segment we should be investing in. How many specifically, so that's controlled for clearly in, in the paper, how many specifically big tech acquisitions are going on in this segment? And so, you know, we, uh, with the sense that that could have either a negative or a positive impact on VC uh, innovation funding. But also, of course, potentially other signals of technological possibilities, other information that those VC funders will have. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the moment, because, of course, that's not controlled for and could potentially be uh, affecting results, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. And so what's the paper testing? Well, it's testing how those recorded big tech acquisitions are affecting future VC investment and deals. So if I'm a VC investor, I, I receive the news that a big tech firm, that one of the GAFAM firms, has just made a, an acquisition in one of these industry segments. What's my reaction? Do I think, should I steer clear because, hey, that big tech firm is now going to take over that segment, or should I uh, jump in and, and decide I'm going to invest more in that, in that segment? Um, but as well as that question about the scale and direction of any impact, it's also questions about timing. So how quickly does VC investment react to, to any news about, um, about acquisitions by big tech firms? I won't labour this because I, in a way, I'm gratified that I um, brought in some of the same information that Tiago did in his presentation, but you, you'll have seen this already. So this is an overview of the data set. It's a very big and very impressive data set. So six, that, more than 6,000 mergers and acquisitions, about 1,500 IPOs and, and 400 acquisitions by the big tech firms here with 32,000 VC deals. I think one thing that's interesting that's talked about a bit in the paper but not so much in the presentation is that if you look at that second column so this is the treated segments the segments where there was a big tech acquisition those the average size of VC deals in there so the third row is quite a lot lower than the untreated segments so VC deals tend to be um, systematically smaller 
in the segments where um, there are acquisitions and where they aren't. Now, that might just be a sign of the differences in those segments in general, but of course, there's, there's some possibility, and again, it's discussed a bit in the paper, there's some possibility that maybe the big tech acquisitions are having an effect there, that maybe, you know, so one hypothesis might be that um, big tech acquisitions are making it easier to bring through deals, so meaning that people are prepared to um, go through for smaller deals than they would be if there was a... Um, without the steer that the GAFAMs care about this sector, but there's also so, uh, potentially some other um, possible explanations there too, and I'll be interested in, in Tiago's thoughts on that uh, in a moment. Um, and just, so, sorry, because I know it may not be clear, especially at the back of the room, so average size of deal is $20 million or so in those segments where big tech has invested versus about $33 million in, in the segments they haven't invested. Um, and then again, Tiago talked about this. What are the results? Well, you're getting a significant effect, essentially, of um, big tech acquisitions on deals and funding, um, so VC deals and VC funding. That impact is particularly outside the US, so yeah, separated out for the EU, but potentially also for uh, non-EU and non-US deals. In terms of, this is showing the results from the, uh, the diff and diff approach. Um, in, in terms of that work, it's not sh finding a causal impact for the US, um, the US venture capital funding in particular, which I think is an interesting result. Again, discussed a bit more in the paper, um, and, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment. So, what's the comment? What are my comments on this? Um, I do think that empirical strategy is really impressive. It's also innovative, particularly in taking the Imai, uh, Kim and Wang approach. And it finds that there are positive impacts of big tech acquisitions on VC deals and funding, with the largest impacts of that first acquisition in an industry segment, which is intuitive, I think. The idea that GAFAM going first into an industry segment might be taken as very important and big news by by venture capital investors. GAFAM companies going in second, third, fourth time might be taken as less important. So I think that, that is fairly intuitive. Um, <clears throat> what questions do I have? So I think I do have questions about the timings of impacts. Where would we ex when would we expect uh, a GAFAM acquisition to have an effect on VC funding and VC deals? Um, and if we go back to those US results, we're actually not seeing a timing at all. We are seeing this coming in in the EU for you know, a quarter after, a couple of quarters after, as Tiago said, but actually in the US we're not seeing an impact coming through there at all. And one of the things I wondered was that maybe for those in the know, if you're in Silicon Valley um, already, actually the, the fact that GAFAM is moving into a particular industry segment just isn't news. You're not getting any news from, from the report of an acquisition, so you're not therefore investing more in the segment. And maybe if you were to see an effect, I don't know how easy or otherwise this would be to look at, but maybe if you were to see an effect, maybe those Silicon Valley firms, the news is a, you know, a quarter before the acquisition's reported or a few quarters before the acquisition's reported. So I, th I think that's a, an interesting thing to um, explore a bit more. The second area is uh, about the, the possible correlations between different types of signal. And again, yeah, Tiago just discuss, does discuss this, of course. But there is a possibility that both big tech acquisitions and VC funding are driven by news about technological possibilities in the industry segment. And again, that could maybe help to explain that limited impact on investment in the US if, if, if they're both being driven by, by common factors. I think there are reasons, again, as discussed in the paper, that maybe that's an unlikely explanation for what, um, what Tiago finds, but I think it's, it's still worth exploring a bit more and I'd be interested in, in further views on that. Um, am I running out of time? I'll just try to conclude. Yeah. All, right. All right, this is my last slide. So, actually, I, I want to say the, the first sentence here, potentially profound implications, type one errors matter, that actually blocking acquisitions in this, act, in, in these, this industry can have potentially quite significant negative effects on innovation activity, and that is, is potentially very problematic. I'll stop there. Yeah.
So that's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for those comments and discussion. Of course, a lot to, to, to discuss. Very, very, yeah, let's clap. Fascinating and, and important results. And, and I think, you know, we, of course, are very much uh, interested in, 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 in the impact of, of those acquisitions in, in funding. But other interesting questions are also on what type of innovation takes place and, you know, also what implications can be for, 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 for merger policy. So that's probably one, you know, pr probably higher level question I would, I would ask to you. But before you can answer to, 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 to those, I would like to open the floor, yes, for more questions. Uh, I'd like to bring back a concept uh, into the discussion that uh, the commentator brought up, which is uh, the vital importance of error costs. Error costs are, 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 have been uh, underweighted in recent commentary, uh, especially, um, of course, uh, false uh, positive um, error costs. And, I, and, and if we just bring in two uh, data points that I believe are in your paper, but you hadn't mentioned in the presentation, to appreciate um, the, uh, what looks like a, a potential error that the regulatory consensus is moving in, in M&A in this area. In excess of 90% of all U.S. VC-backed startups monetize through an acquisition, not through an, an IPO. This is not a recent development, it's a long-lasting development. And so when we, when we have a paper that has a data set of this size, and not the NBER study, which has a data set of nine transactions actions by two companies, right? The weight of the evidence clearly shows that the consensus in the business community, which is that acquisitions send a positive signal back to the VC investor, it funds the startup, what we're doing in the regulatory consensus, and it's not just commentary, it's action right now, is has an almost necessarily anti-competitive effect. It's raising the entry costs for startups into the VC sector. And I think this is a vital role that scholarship can play, objective, empirical scholarship, uh, uh, waiting carefully to make a policy decision until we have the evidence in front. So that wasn't really a question, but that was a, that was a comment. <laughs> but an important one, uh, nonetheless. Uh, Nicolas also has a comment or question. Yes, I, thank you very much, uh, Rafael. <clears throat> so I have a question that essentially follows up of, on what Jonathan was saying. At last, at, I would like to ask if you've shown the results of your very large empirical study to the initial writers of these killer act papers, you know, Florian Ederer and others, and Luigi Zingales and others, and what they say when they're shown the numbers. That's the, fir the first question. Second question, have you presented that work to policymakers? I mean, you have a chance to do this here, but you know, what kind of reaction do you get? Because the problem of the killer acquisition story is that the story is just too good not to be told. You know, everyone wants to believe in this, right? It's just such a good story. But when, when you look into this in detail, as Jonathan was saying, and, you know, we are a bunch here trying to work on this, the numbers do not fit the story. So, and especially not in that sector of the economy. So, you know, what kind of reaction did you get when you show, showed these results to the people who created that idea? I mean, it's, you know, Pierre was talking about fables. I think we are very, very close here to discussing what... Um, what, you know, um, what's his name, the Nobel Prize economist, you know, he wrote a, a paper or book on narratives and fables, a country called Robert sure, Schiller. Sure. You know, what's the reaction you get? Ta-da! Okay, great. Um, uh, I'd like to comment also from a company perspective, having been in the companies and also been in the VC community a lot, and I think that what, uh, I think it is a fable, for sure. And, and it's a very erroneous fable, which you, you show. I, I think from my experience, especially, say, in Silicon Valley, certainly, but also in, say, Boston, where I live, in the, uh, in the biotech company community, this is a process. This is an this is a established market, okay? You know, you know comp companies are built, and the expectation in many cases is they're going to be acquired here, there, or there. And the, the people involved are knowledgeable on both sides. So the buyers and the sellers, and the, the VCs, the people running the companies, and the people in the companies are all very knowledgeable about what's going on. And they're very knowledgeable early on because they're co-inventing the idea of these businesses to eventually be acquired and integrated. 
Um, and, and, and this is part of an ecosystem strategy on the part of everybody there. Um, and we, we have a, I, I'm not mentioning it here today, but I've been working with people at Xinhua in, uh, in China, and we have a very, very large data set there looking at um, spin-outs of, of the various uh, platform companies. And what's really, and looking at whether the spin-outs are uh, related to, like could be acquired or will, or will essentially be an active partner in the ecosystem or are they something else? And, and we have a very, very large data set and it's very, very clear what's going on, that people are spinning out of these things and they're building complements or subspecializations within the ecosystem. Uh, all, everybody with knowledge of it. So, uh, and the last thing I'd say, and this is the problem with the, the, the signaling from the government is, the, the party who's not at the table in this are the regulators, and in, in my experience, and they and they don't know how the people in the companies are thinking, okay, and um, and the people in the companies don't really know how the regulators are thinking, but they're very gun shy about them, and and this is a, 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 a crucial thing. I think often we imagine that people in these companies are sort of insulated in fat cats, and 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 in, and in fact, they're acutely sensitive to to, to being sort of attacked essentially blind and from the side uh, from, from regulators. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of pos possible harm coming from government interventions that are, are naive to the, to the overall process. So. Yes. Any reactions? I can. You want to? Uh, I could start. Yeah. Uh, just with, like, some comments made by, by Joe here. Uh, first, how long do I have? Like 10 minutes? Just a few. No, no. Few? few. <laughs> okay, we started later, so <laughs> I should claim that 10 yeah, minutes. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, first, like maybe some overarching comments. Like, I will start with the second one about the difference on, on the effects on US and Europe. Uh, something that we have, like, conjectured and, and discussed in a paper, like, on the reason why this effect is so. Is so like bigger in Europe than in US is exactly the, the like how dynamic is is the US market as you said like this is not necessarily news our like one of the one of the tables that i showed uh, uh, showed that actually during that time i had uh, yeah maybe i don't want to like this one for example if you see the the second like the the, the fourth column you saw like first line you see that we had 17,000 venture capital deals in, in U.S. against 5,000 5, in Europe in the, same, in the same time. So we have a much more, like, let's say, this also answered the, the, like, the other question about the difference in the average funding per deal. Because if you have much more startups there, you have much more deals, so the average funding per deal may be lower. And if you see the, the worldwide is, like, average funding per deal, second row, uh, third line is uh, 20 in, uh, in the treated and, and more than 30 in the untreated. But when you see in Europe, this is not true. Uh, so, so you see like the difference is much uh, less. While in US, like the difference is much higher. So the US is somehow biasing and then you have probably, this is a case of, of too many startups there, too many uh, options for venture capitalists so they don't just bet too much in, in each in each deal that they do. Uh, these are some, some, some uh, 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 explanations for this difference and also for the difference between Europe and US because like the dynamic, like the dynamism of, of the US venture capital activity and even in US the, the, the five big techs are not the most, like the biggest acquis like acquirers. Like we have many others like Qualcomm, IBM, uh, others that acquire much more than Google, like Meta or, or Amazon uh, in US. So, so this is another, so for a, a venture capitalist, like the big tech in New US, in US is not necessarily uh, uh, like the leader to follow, you know, like when they, they want to, like to choose a, an industry segment. So this I think address like two, two questions. I want to like just to react to the comment made by, by Jonathan. Yeah, on, on the importance of the empirical grounding of this stuff. Like, just my background, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. So, 
So I, when I started looking the, the discussion and the theoretical discussion, I was missing like, where is the evidence? <laughs> I, want to, I want to investigate if uh, actually this happens or not. So I tried to find a way to, like, to go through data to somehow give more, more enlightenment to, to the discussion. Of course, this is not only the, the like, like maybe even not the most important evidence because one may, may, may raise that the, the long-term effects may, may be much, much more harmful uh, or not. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's one piece of the puzzle, in my view, to, to understand this and somehow addressing uh, Nicola, uh, question on how people react and how people like how we are spreading this <laughs> it's, it's a difficult challenge that everyone has to like uh, uh, make uh, policymakers and even the business uh, uh, attentive to research results so <laughs> we are trying to spread uh, as much as possible but with all the, the the caveats that comes with like to make like our contribution like for example the causality here we had a long like long back and forth with the reviewers of information economics and policy on like if this cause or not are you <laughs> actually identifying causal relations or not uh, considering that other factors like venture capitalists mainly f uh, invest uh, not necessarily because like there may be an acquisition or an IPO maybe in that industry segment by a big tech or, like backed by a big tech or something it's important but the relationship with the founder of the startups are really like very important in all the literature, the management literature that we saw. Uh, also, other after, or, or other like the, the level of knowledge of, of the venture capital uh, in, uh, company with the industry segment in specific, the previous acquisitions made on that industry or, or, or venture capital deals made there. So other op, other uh, uh, factors that we try to control using the, the, the two like the two way uh, fixed affix approach and and the, and the, and then the difference in difference uh, modified approach there but uh, still like more variables would more data would help to 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 achieve that okay. just I'm not sure if, if dr. Barr wants to well just maybe um, molecular acquisitions no, just just one or two quick points. I mean, it's it's difficult to shift the policy narrative, right? Once 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 an idea has gone viral, and it's in, really interesting if you look at all the reports that have come out in the last five years or so, it, how, how that argument has been repeated. Right? And so it's also important to understand what we can, what you cannot derive from our insight, and that is. It, there's no, there's no sort of a, a prima facie claim to say you, you shouldn't look at, at merger proposals, right? I mean that that we cannot really derive this from the data that we have. But what we can say is that the bigger framing of of, of, of what the role and, and the effect of these acquisitions is is actually wrong. It's very erroneous. Right? It's it's driven by by a very narrow set of ideas. And, and um, the other thing that we uh, to your to your question, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and thanks for the for the comments and, and and the feedback. Is what we also don't know right now is is what type of innovation has happened afterwards, right? So this is a this is kind of a really sort of uh, the idea is that uh, resources are enabling innovation, but we don't really go into what kind of innovation, how it's really uh, unfolds from that point forward. And uh, that would be an interesting additional project, but we don't we don't have the details actually to yeah. do this right now. We don't have the data. Yeah. Okay. Maybe then uh, last. No, my, ah. Okay. The last question. Then yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm standing between you know uh, this session and lunch. So very quickly. Um. I mean, uh, great study. We're doing something very similar um, as well. But uh, looking more just comments, but this is published. So, uh, but looking more into the dynamics, right, um, of these effects. I think that you know maybe as a follow up. Um, one interesting aspect to look at is where those um, um, investments go in terms of money. Because, I mean, this is, I think, you know, very relevant also for the implication for policy. Because if this is, you know, um, something that where money goes, you know, to uh, rivals, so there is a, you know, that the actual the acquisition is a trigger for a race to, you know, rivalry, you know, competitions in prisons, emerging technologies, right? So that's that's a really boost and, and a trigger to you know uh, innovation um, that you know foment plurality, right? Of alternatives. Oh, if this is you know a race to uh, milk the cow, sort of, right? So investment that then have you know really short-term effects in terms of capturing the value that 
might sidestep you know, out of this. So that's one comment. And the other one is more about, um, yeah, you look at the aggregate effects, um, but you know, I was wondering whether there are some conditionings of those effects, right? So that you know, if there are other aspects of the dimension that you know, in some cases, uh, you know, the effects are bigger. In some other cases, the effects are not there. In other cases, the effects are even negative. But this might be might have to do, for instance, with the development stage of the segments, the products, or whatever, right? So, end of the cycle, beginning of the cycle, might have you know different impacts. Thank you. Yeah, just some brief comments on that. Like, thank you for the comment, the question. Uh, I like when we tried to segment the data in 173 industry segments, it was a very like idea of trying to portray a group of, of similar companies to those that received the start like the acquisitions, uh, trying to portray like investment going to the rivals of, of the ones that, that received the like the, 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 the like that were acquired by one of the big techs. So we cannot like assure like with the data we have data about the, the, the startups that receive the, the venture like the venture capital funding. We could go deeper on this uh, with the data that we have. Uh, but we didn't. What we made was basically focusing on trying to categorize the, the actually, the data came already categorized by the CB Insights uh, uh, that gives us the, that, like, the data set where we could focus on, okay, so uh, in one of, like, here in, in the industry segment, so we, we just see, like, internet and then Inside internet, we have internet industry, like an industry of internet uh, software and service, and then uh, the sub industry is uh, travel, uh, and then uh, the other is office or website hosting. So they are very specific industry segments where we portray the startups, trying to understand uh, what happened with the, the 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 startup that were just around, maybe rivals. To be rivals, it should be something like, real ge like geographic, maybe the US and their Europe uh, approach uh, gives some of this sense. But uh, this is the far we, we went in, in terms of identifying the, 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 where the funding goes. And another thing is like, is the funding increasing in that, in that industry segment that received the, the deal because of actually adjacent industries are being defunded? Like, uh, venture capitalists are just moving from, instead of uh, betting here, I'll bet on, the, on that other side because I, I saw an acquisition of a platform that has a lot of information from everything and so on and so forth that I don't uh, as, a, as a, like a standalone venture capitalist or something. So, but this is really like a, a, an important point, like where the, the funding goes and, and how, how we somehow track this. Okay, well, we could go on for, for a very long time, but uh, I think unfortunately we have to stop. So I would like again to thank the presenter and the discussant for this very interesting discussion. Thank you.